Now, if you would grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, um, we're going to read the same verses we did last week and, and look at, uh, at a, few, a few different points here from that. So Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Um, I'm just going to give you a second to get there, and I just want to remind you, if you do not have a Bible, uh, we do have some in the back, and just like the Gideons feel, you can absolutely steal our Bibles anytime you want to. <laughs> if you know somebody that needs one, please uh, feel free to give them out. So Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1, uh, let's just read these few verses. The Bible says this, now in, in the church in at, at, excuse me, now in the church at Antioch, There were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. And so we're going to stop right there. And if you remember, does anybody remember last week what the main point or main focus of last week's message was? Ordinary people. Ordinary people, Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, and that was our, our, our main point was when we read about these people in the Bible, uh, they're just people. They're people no different than you and I. When we think of these guys as missionaries, they're people no different than Dan. God placing a call on a heart and saying, yes, I'll go. And, and they're just ordinary people, but, but they've been asked to do extraordinary things, and by the power of God in them, they've done those things. And now, this week, what I want to do is I want to continue to learn from those ordinary people as we see what it was they were doing and what they got to experience. It's a simple four-point message this morning, uh, excuse me, five-point message this morning, I'm sorry, eight Point. There's points today. Um, and, and, uh, but it's real simple, real basic, I think, yet so important. Um, and so here's the first point today as we look at learning from the early church and the Word of God. The first point is this, worship. If, you, if you're a note taker, just write that one word down, worshiping. Um, so here's what it says in verse 2. It says, while they, they being all of these believers, while they were worshiping the Lord. Now, if you happen to have a New King James Version Bible, which is what, what I have, I, I'll read from New King James and I'll read from the NIV. Um, but the New King James Version, it says that they were ministering to the Lord. And, and if you were to look in your Strong's Concordance, I know many of you, you like to study the Bible, the Strong's Concordance, it breaks down specific words and gives you the Greek and Hebrew meaning behind them. And if you were to look up that word ministering, um, you, you get to the Greek and what it really means is um, doing your religious duties is what it says in the Strong's Concordance. Now it's easy for you to say, well, hold on, Bill, you, you always say we're not supposed to be religious. No, nope, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about doing things because then it breaks it down, things like worship. And so what they were doing is they were gathered together and they were worshiping the Lord. And, and it's, it's very important to me, I think, that we talk about this because so many of us today, if you, if you look at the, the evangelical church in America, um, you have a lot of different church backgrounds that are coming together in, in the evangelical church. Our church, for example. Our church here, this campus, it, this campus is made up of all different kinds of church backgrounds. Um, I, I grew up, I come from a Lutheran background. I know there's some of you from the Catholic church background, some of you from the Methodist church, um, some of you from the Baptist church. And what we have, and then some of you obviously from the Assemblies of God Church. So we have all of these different pasts coming together now making up this church. And worship is a very important part of what we do here at this church. You'll notice even even the breakdown in the template of our service. We spend anywhere from 10, 12, up to 20, 25 minutes at the beginning of our services, having a time of worship. 
And, and that worship for some of you, even though maybe you've been coming here even for a couple years, this still might be a very foreign thing to you. Because like me in my upbringing, Neil, I, I experienced, um, and I'm not saying what's right or wrong. Please hear that clearly. I experienced going to church and we had a hymnal. Uh, actually, I have one of our old hymnals from the old church that I used to go to in my office. Um, and, and that was your worship service consisted of going through the program in the hymnal, right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The, the, a liturgical church. Um, some of you, the, the Methodist church, um, I remember uh, I, I get to go to Point Pleasant. Does anybody know what Point Pleasant is? Point Pleasant is a, is a local kind of elderly living facility. And I love getting to go to Point Pleasant and, and I do chapel services there once or twice a month. And there was a guy that, that unfortunately he passed away, but I loved this guy. His name was Jerry. And, and Jerry was, a, was an old Methodist pastor. I think he was in his 90s. And, and, and for a Methodist, it's, it's about that. There, there's, a, there's structure, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about today? That's their structure. And again, please hear my heart. I'm not saying right or wrong. Different. That's all. And so there's that structure. Well, so, so I would go in and I started doing these chapel services. And Jerry just didn't quite know what to do with this. Because, because I went in and... We didn't read certain verses at a time. We didn't do the Lord's Prayer every time. There, there wasn't this, this structure. Instead, Denise would sing a couple songs and I'd get all worked up about reading the Bible. And then I'd, and then I'd say, amen, let's, let's go home. And he'd just kind of be like, because to him, something was missing there. Does this make sense to you? Because there, was, there wasn't the, the structure we're used to. And so now, for some of you, maybe you have that, that same experience Maybe you're in this, this evangelical, this, this Pentecostal, charismatic um, church, and everything just is different. You, you love how it feels. You like coming to see the people. But there's this part when it comes to this worship that sometimes we, we maybe don't know what to do with. And I think that this is such an important time because this time of worship it sets aside and turns our focus. It puts aside the distractions and it turns our focus completely on the Lord to minister to Him. And just like, like today during worship, you'll hear Denise um, or at the end of worship, the words that I was speaking to God, that's ministering to the Lord, sharing with Him my love, my adoration, my gratefulness, giving Him my attention, does that make sense to you? It's setting this all aside for this time. And for some of us, again, depending on our backgrounds, for some of us, the strangest thing is trying to say what's in your heart. It's trying to express to God not what's written on a piece of paper or in, in our case, projected on the wall. Right, Chad? It's not projected. No one's saying, okay, repeat after me. Um, I, I remember growing up, and maybe some of you will, will get this, I always have fun around Easter time in this Assemblies of God church because I, I, I remember like years and years and years around Easter time, He is risen. Exactly. And, that, and, that's, and, and that's, it does something to me. So when I say that stuff around Denise, because Denise is, like Denise was Assemblies of God, I think, in the womb, right? So this is all she's known is Assemblies of God. She doesn't know the liturgy. She doesn't know that Lutheran or Methodist Catholic background. So I love pulling from these, these old roots. But again, for some of us, we don't know what to do with this natural expression of how I feel about who God is, of how I feel about Jesus, of how much I want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you see, that's the, the time of worship that we have. It's not simply a time to sing the songs on the screen. The desired purpose is that these songs on the screen are simply a springboard to get you and I to the place where now we are speaking our praise to God. Because what we have to be careful of is this, is that even though we're a, a spirit-filled, Bible-believing, evangelical church, I want you to understand something so clearly. 
we can very easily fall into the rut of simply reading what's in front of us and not expressing what's in our heart. And, and what is God after? God is after our hearts. And see, we can, we can very easily slip into the outward religious if we're not careful. God's after our hearts. It's turning this time right now, this, this time that we call worship, it's turning all of the distractions as much as we can off and turning our focus on the Lord. Have you ever heard the term, um, like if you think of, of a married couple, okay, um, Chris and Liz Doherty, wonderful young couple, um, beautiful children, and, and if you were to watch, like just sitting here, um, or watch, looking at them sitting there, Chris has his arm around Liz, and, and you watch them interact with each other, and you've seen couples like this, right? Um, and you, you've even come to this, this, this statement where you would say, man, he, he worships the ground she walks on, <laughs> right? Has anybody ever heard that term? Oh, oh, yeah, he says, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Ron and Sharon Shower, exactly the same thing. Um, Sharon worships the ground that Ron walks on. I mean, there's... <laughs> you thought I was coming a different direction, did you? Yeah, <laughs> see? That's the one positive for the rest of the year, Ron. That's it right there. But, but now here's the question, because you, I think you all understand what I'm talking about and the statement I make. Um, but here's the question I want to ask you, and I want you to think about this for a second now when we're talking about worship. What is it that you see? What, what is it that you observe that leads you to that conclusion to make that statement about a couple? Do you understand the question I'm asking? What, what behaviors do you observe? What, what do you hear? And, and to me... To me, what I see is, is like um, the way that person serves the other one, right? I mean, you, you watch Sharon and Ron. Sharon is endlessly serving Ron, right? I don't know if it's love or just because she needs to because he doesn't do anything. I don't know. <laughs> but, there's, but do you understand what I mean? No, there's this, there's this man, you just, just watch. I, I watch my mom and dad. I use them as an example. Um, you know, they're... They're mentors to me, and, and they, they're just a great example. But I watch mom and dad, and I, I watch how they serve each other. And that's something that would make me say that statement. How about how they, um, a, a couple talks about each other, right? You hear Lou Campbell talk about Pam. Um, never when she's around. Um, <laughs> but when you hear Lou talk about Pam, the, the way he talks about here, it's like you come to one of two conclusions, Either one, he, like, he worships the ground she walks on, right? I mean, he just loves and adores her. Or two, he is just terrified of her. I mean, it's one of those two things. But either way, you come to the same conclusion. But there's a behavior that's witnessed. And again, when I think of this, I love Jesus. I absolutely love him. And when I worship him, I want him to know that. Like, I, I tell him, there's times when I'm by myself, and I'm telling Jesus, I'm, I'm worshiping my Lord and my Savior, and I'm saying, I just adore you. I, I cherish you. I love you so much. I want to serve you. And I want to express all of this to him. You see, that's That's worship. It's, it's something where, where we, we engage in it. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like we, we engage in worship. And I know for some people, this is where the foreign part of worship comes in. Because maybe we come from a place where I didn't have to do anything other than recite what was in the book or what I had memorized. I don't know about you, but I, I had the services kind of memorized, right? And again, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm saying different. And what our desire here is, is, is this, is it's like, I want to engage in my worship with him. I want to lift his name up. I want to praise his name. I want to bring glory and honor to him. I want to express my adoration and my love for him. All of this is part of worship. And Neil, it might seem completely foreign to some, but I believe that as we read our Bibles, this is what God is after. This engaging in worship. 
And there's no, listen, there, we, can, we can look through the Bible and come up and show uh, biblically all of the different physical uh, positions, if you will, that we should be taking in worship, right? The Bible talks about uh, the disciples. When, when Jesus did some amazing things, the Bible says, and they worshiped him. But if you look that up, what they did was they prostrated themselves before him. There's times where people knelt before him. The Bible talks about raising hands. The Bible talks about all of these physical things. I'm not talking about that part of things. Because I know for some of you, the thought of raising your hands is like, bruh, you can break my shoulders and I ain't raising my hands in church. And, I, and I, I know that's between you and the Lord, 100%. What I'm talking about is not the physical right now. I'm talking about the heart. Because whatever we do has to start in our heart because that's the thing that God is after, to engage with Him. And one of the reasons I think it's so important that we engage with Him is because we want Him to engage with us. There's people that, that, that sometimes um, they, they like to, to argue with me about things. And, and sometimes I think it's fun, you know. They, they want to try and correct or redirect me. And, and recently I had someone telling me about like this stuff in the book of Acts, you know. Um, not necessarily appreciating that we are still in the book of Acts. Because they want me to talk about more of the, um, the day-to-day activities and life circumstances and how to deal with family and stuff like that. And my response is this. Um, is, is like if you want to navigate life and life difficulties, my opinion is not necessarily the one that you ought to be looking for. God's is 100% the one you want to be looking for. And again, I want to say this to you now, as we go back to what we're looking at in the book of Acts, chapter 13, we just read this. The church, and if you will, again, the book of Bill, right? This, the Bible doesn't say this. It's how things work in my head. I read this and I say, um, I, I make it real to life for you and me today. And they were worshiping together at Maranatha Chisago Lakes campus. <laughs> And as they were worshiping, they heard from the Holy Spirit. You see, this is, this is what we ought to be looking for. This is what we ought to be hungry for. Is this time of worship where we are turning our focus on the Lord, where we are, we are engaging with Him, where we are lifting Him up and we are praising Him, that opens this, this line of communication up where we ought to be hungry to hear from God, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and that's where the guidance you're looking for comes from. How do you find peace in dealing with your family on Thanksgiving? Because I know some of your circumstances, some of the dynamics, man, it's not easy, right? There's all kinds of things going on. But again, to me, to find the direction and the peace and the guidance, that ought to come from the Holy Spirit. So in this time of worship, when we're tuning everything out, we're, we're just focusing on the Lord, all of a sudden, this two-way thing starts happening right here. Does that make sense to you? The other thing I think that is so important about this time of worship and, and, and why we do this is because I believe that when we worship and we tune in and we focus on God, it prepares our hearts for the Word and to hear the truth of His Word. Amen? Amen. That's worship. And I could, I could just feel like I could talk about that for three, four weeks. But for the sake of the message today, it's um, looking at what they were doing. So the first thing is this, is that, that they were worshiping. Now, now here's what the Bible says. Look at verse 2. Um, lest we lose interest today. Verse 2, and it it says this, and as they ministered to the Lord and and they fasted, or as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So now this this is going to introduce or maybe remind some of you of, um, of this whole idea of fasting. Because I know for some of you, this has been something that maybe years ago, this was a, a big thing in your church or personally. Um, but some of the spiritual disciplines, if you will, in the Christian church, I believe have gone away because we're afraid to talk about them uh, because the, the, it's easy to communicate uh, 
uh, an idea, this is what you have to do. Great, one more thing to add to my checklist. This is not a checklist thing. This is a biblical thing, okay? I'm going to try and get through this quick. Um, Spiritual, uh, excuse me, why do we fast? What is fasting? Real quick. Fasting is not simply skipping a meal. I want to be sure about that. If you skip a meal and you don't spend time with the Lord, you're just skipping a meal. And in my head, I, it, I do not understand why anybody would ever skip a meal. Right? <laughs> why? I mean, eat. Right? Eat. Let's eat. Um, right now, actually, let's eat. What time is breakfast, by the way? 10? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be tight for you, just letting you know. <laughs> but here's the deal. Uh, so the whole idea of fasting is this. And, and the main, main thing we want to focus on is, is a meal, right? But in, in this day and age, there are a lot of things that people fast from. People will fast from the television. People will fast from things like YouTube or video games or, or whatever. There's just different things. But I want you to understand something clearly. The whole idea of fasting, Dan, it's not simply to stop doing something. The idea of fasting is to... It's kind of this, to, to sacrifice something in the physical to focus on something in the spiritual. Does that make sense to everybody? And this might be a, a new thing to you. That's the whole idea of it. So if you, if you were to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast um, for lunch today, the idea is this, is that in place of sitting down and eating that meal, you take that time and you spend the time with the Lord, seeking the Lord, praying to the Lord. Make sense? Same thing with YouTube. Instead of going down the YouTube wormhole for 12 hours, you spend that time on the Lord. Anybody know what I'm talking about by the YouTube wormhole? A couple of you do. All right, so here's the thing. We're going to do a real fast scriptural survey of some fasting examples. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Please stay with me. Please pick your Bibles back up if you set them down. Open your phones back up because we're going to look at three or four verses real quick. Um, just to, to touch on a couple things. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And this is one of the places where we get the idea that this is a, it's a spiritual discipline. It's not like it's just this, well, it was talked about a couple times in the Bible, now we don't have to worry about it. This is something I believe that we should have in our Christian walk. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. Is anybody there with me? Here's what the Bible says is this. Jesus is speaking now, okay? And here's what he says. He says, when you fast, and that's important, there's a when and not an if, right? And when you fast, listen now, he says this, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Uh, remember that word hypocrites, it means play actors. Remember, uh, he says, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And so here's what Jesus is talking about right there. Don't fast for the sake of trying to impress your Christian brothers and sisters. Don't do this as an outward show because that, that's, again, the whole point is missed then when you do this for the sake of other people and to be kind of uh, glorifying yourself and showing everybody that you're fasting. Make sense? Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Verse 17, he says, But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to, to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The whole purpose of fasting, it is, it's for the Lord, right? Not for the sake of impressing religious people. Don't, don't make a big scene and get all dramatic about it. Um, take care of yourself. Be presentable. That's what he's talking about. Um, and do this for the Lord. All right. Go, go to the book of Esther, chapter 4. These are just a few examples of, um, of fasting and the circumstances that these people did this because maybe some of these circumstances line up with, with some of your life circumstances. And you can include fasting as you seek the Lord. Esther. Esther chapter 4. Everybody find it? Yep. By the way, did you notice we started our second section of journey through the Bible over here? Um, instead of adding new ones, what we're going to try doing is unveiling this time around. 
So we're going to continue on, and um, Alice has made a design that will slowly be uh, being revealed in there. This last week, we talked about Job and Esther. So Esther chapter 4, verse 15, and this is the part here where Esther is going to go before the king and make a plea to try to save her people. And here's what she does, uh, what she asks. Verse 15 says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, uh, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And just so everybody understands what she's talking about here, she's going to go to the king and, and present a request. And because she's going to the king, um, her life is on the line with this request. So she is, she is praying and fasting, and she's asking these other people to join her in this, in, in a prayer for and looking for, for favor from the Lord. So again, I want, to, I want to put this out there now because the idea is this. It's not just that we talk about fasting today. Not just that we talk about worship today. But that what we do is we, we look at this and say, hey, wait a minute, is this something I need to or want to introduce into my life? So if you have never engaged in worship where you have spoke out your praise and adoration and love for God, then my challenge is take a step then when you have that next opportunity. For fasting, if, if you have something coming up where you, you're looking and you've been praying to God for favor in this situation, then maybe this is an opportunity for you to incorporate fasting. Where you could say, hey, you know what? This is coming up on Wednesday. Um, Tuesday, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast Tuesday night for supper and I'm going to just spend that hour on my knees pleading to God, praying to God for that favor. And maybe like what Esther did, Maybe you're going to reach out to some of your Christian brothers and sisters, your family members even, and you're going to say, hey, we got this major thing coming up in life. Would you pray and fast with me? Because I really need God's favor. Does that make sense to you guys? Again, to, to introduce this, I want to show you just a couple more examples. I want to turn, turn to the book of Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And we're going to look at just another example of, of, um, of fasting. And in this, the Lord is speaking, and, and He's talking about, again, the importance of this, this repentance coming from the heart, this brokenness coming from the heart. Joel chapter 2. How are we doing? Did we find it? Yes. Working on it? Joel chapter 2. With the youth kids, what I have them do is start hollering uh, um, uh, page numbers. Because all, all the kids, whether it's 6, 8, 10, dozen, 15, they all sit here with a Bible, um, and they got a couple different versions and stuff. And I just say, when you find it, yell out a page number. And you get 860, 907. Every once in a while, someone says, page 8. <laughs> yeah. And then we work with that kid. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what the Bible says is this. Even now, declares the Lord, it says, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. He's saying this, uh, instead of tearing your, your garments in this mourning or in this repentance, he's saying this, I'm not interested in that. Tear your heart. Uh, like Psalm 51 says, a broken and contrite heart. That's what God is after. But verse 13, he says, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. And so in this example right here, this is, this is in the context of repentance, of coming back to God. And, and again, I want to say this to you. Maybe you have wandered from the Lord. Maybe your life has been filled with, with all kinds of sin, secret sin, outward sin, whatever it is, and you are feeling the Lord calling you to this place of repentance. Then here's what I want to encourage you to do. Maybe you would consider this. 
Maybe as part of showing that brokenness of your heart, the mourning that, that you're, you're coming to because of your sin, maybe, maybe a fast is in need. Maybe a fast would be uh, appropriate at that time. Where tonight, the, the Lord calling you because of His kindness to that place of repentance, tonight, maybe instead of dinner, you just need to spend that time with the Lord being broken before Him. Tearing that heart, being broken, and coming back to Him. You see, there's all these different types, kinds, and examples of fasting. Turn to Ezra chapter 8, if you would, please. Ezra chapter 8. Please keep turning pages. It seems like as the service goes on, the more scriptures, the less pages I hear turning. <laughs> like people just start putting their Bible down. Oh, let's see, maybe if I stop reading, he'll stop talking. Ezra chapter 8. Now this is an example of of fasting and, and pleading for God's protection. And, and again, every time I read this, in my simple mind, what I come to is it's almost like this. By making this sacrifice in the physical and focusing on the spiritual, it's almost like I'm underlining or highlighting or putting my prayer in, in bold letters. You know, when you, when you text and you, you send a text in all caps, do you know that means you're yelling at somebody? That's what all caps means in a text. Do you have any idea how many of you text me accidentally all caps and it freaks me out? It's, it's terrible. Or an email, all caps. I mean, it's like... Pfft. But that's the way I look at fasting. It's like what I'm saying, it's almost like I'm saying to God, God, I'm really serious about this. God, I really need this. God, I'm really, I, I'm crying out. And we're turning that focus that much more on uh, the Lord and our need for Him. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Are you guys with me? Are you there? Are you still? Okay. Here's what the Bible says. It says, There by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children with all of our possessions. He says, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king... The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. Verse 23 says, So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So this is an example of fasting and praying, crying out because of the protection that was needed. And again, you guys, honestly, this list can go on and on and on. But my encouragement is, is if you have something weighing on you, maybe it's something with one of your kids, maybe it's something in your marriage, maybe it's feeling God's call on your life and wanting that clear direction, whatever it is, I, I just want to encourage you with this, maybe consider incorporating some type of a fast for a period of time to focus on the Lord as we cry out to Him. The first thing, they were worshiping. Second thing is they were fasting. And then what happens from all of this? Stay with me now. I feel like I got to come out there, Chris, stand right in front of you a little bit. Here's the thing. Here's what happens is this. Point number three, write this down, the Holy Spirit. Again, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit spoke, and I believe that He speaks to us. I believe He wants to speak to us. I believe God wants to engage and communicate and lead and guide and direct and call and equip. I believe God wants to do all of these things. And I believe He does that through the Holy Spirit. And this all took place while they were worshiping and fasting. While they were focusing on the Lord, focusing on God. And again, I talk about this um, to, to deal with the social issues, to deal with the family issues, to deal with the financial issues, to deal with all this. As a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled Christian, I want to remind you of something. You can listen to a million podcasts that might give you good information, but when you hear the truth from God, something powerful happens. And that's one of the benefits of in a time of worship, Matt, is saying this, is saying, God, I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to engage. And God, my heart's desire is, I want to hear from you. 
I got this crazy thing going on with one of my kids. God, I need to hear from you because you are holy. You are all powerful. You are all knowing. God, you alone, you alone, God, can give me what I need and guide me through this time. And all of a sudden, you start to feel and hear the presence, the power, and the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you in that moment. And do you understand the importance of this? You see, we want to hear from God. I would even go this far. Neil, we need to hear from God. We need to hear from God. And the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what happens when we shut everything off and turn our focus on Him. Lori, here's the, the next thing. The next point is this. So we have, they were worshiping, they were fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke to them, right? And that's a good thing, is it not, Dan? Yeah. But then here's what happens, is this. They send. Because remember what the Holy Spirit said was this, set aside for me Barnabas and Saul. Now I start getting excited about things like this. Because what I start wanting to hear from God is, is this. Because again, in my mind, it's, it's today. As I read that in the Bible, it's like, this is, this is today. And we're worshiping, and we're focusing on God, and, and the Holy Spirit is present because He still speaks to us today, just like He did 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit speaks to us, and we hear as a body, right? Remember, imagine this, reading a Bible 2,000 years down the road, someone writes about Maranatha Church, Chisago Lakes campus. And what they write is, and they were worshiping and fasting, and the Holy Spirit spoke, and what they heard was, set aside for me, Jerry and Sandy. Set aside for me, Pam and Lou. Set aside for me, Jerry and Linda. Set aside for me these. You see, this is, this is what I believe we hear. And then as a church, though, what we need to do as we hear these things is we need to send and this is a very hard thing to do. I was talking to a guy in my office a week or two ago. And he's telling me about, about the ideas that God is sharing with him and, and the heart he has to reach men and, and just wanting to do this stuff. And he said, but, but you'll never get rid of me. I'm never leaving this place. And on one end, I'm like, praise the Lord, man, because I don't want you to go anywhere. And then God says something. And God challenges my heart because I love this guy. And what I hear from God is, but what if I ask him to leave? And then I say, no, you can't have him. No, I'm just <laughs> but that's, that's what I mean. That's the reality of what we want, isn't it? You see, we have to remember this, is that it's not about Maranatha Church, Chisago Lakes campus. And in the Christian world in America today, we've made it about a church. It's not about a church. It's about the church, and it's about the church growing, and people getting saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then spreading the gospel. And in order for that to happen, I have to be willing to let you go. And I don't want to do that. You might have a friend that comes to you and says, God is calling me to start a church on the North Shore. You might have a friend come to you and say, God's calling me to start a church in Hawaii, in fact. And then what you do is smack them and say, no, he's not. <laughs> the Bahamas. I don't think so, Tim. But do you understand what I'm saying? We have, to, we have to understand there's a much bigger picture than just what we love. Because there's nothing more important than people knowing about Jesus. There's nothing more important. I see, again, Chris and Liz and, and their daughter Fallon sitting next to them. Well, what if Fallon's the next Mother Teresa, sitting here feeling God's call on her life just like Teresa did, about the same age. What if God is calling her to something? Then guess what? They got to be okay to let her go. You see, this is, this is part of what I learned in the Bible is this, is like this is the reality. 
Set aside for me Barnabas and Saul. These guys worked closely together. They ministered together. Their hearts were tied together. God's saying, set, set them aside. Send them out to do what I have called them to do. My prayer is that you would hear God's call for your life. Young and old alike. And that brings us to our fifth point. And that's this. They were worshiping and fasting and they heard from the Holy Spirit and they heard that God called Barnabas and Saul. They need to send them. The fifth thing is if God calls you, you need to go. And that's scary. It's scary to be called by God. And to take a step. It's scary to be the ones sent out. I remember when I was first coming to this campus. Listen, what is it from, how many miles from here to the Forest Lake campus? Eight or ten? And what I felt in my heart, I felt like, like I was being sent to Africa. Because... I was a fish out of water, wasn't I? You guys remember. I was a fish out of water coming here. Totally foreign. I didn't know the people. And I was being asked to leave what I called home and what was familiar, where I had friends. I liked people. I don't know if they liked me, but I liked people there. <laughs> but I was, asked to, I was asked to leave. I was the one being sent and I was the one that had to be okay going to something new. And I look at it now, however many years later, and it's like, wow, that's, it's unbelievable that this now is what's become. It's, it's unbelievable. You see, God God calls. When we are listening, God calls. And when we say yes to that call, we become ordinary people getting to do extraordinary things because we say yes to that call. And it's not just the young people. God calls us at all ages, people. Ron and Sharon, you guys have a beautiful home. I mean, if you've never been... Uh, I'll give you their address. <laughs> they would love for have, to have you stop by sometime. Um, especially during hunting season at 8.30 a.m. <laughs> pop in. But they have a beautiful home. They, they literally, with their own hands and labor, they've built a beautiful home and they have a bit of land and it's a beautiful, beautiful oasis home. It's wonderful. But even, even like you guys, even for Ron and Sharon, I, I kind of want to say this. You're not off the hook. Because you have a beautiful home and you have a place and this is where your feet and your roots are down deep. None of us as believers are out of, um, what do you, how do you say that? Um, are off limits to be called by God to do something. Does that make sense, Chris? Don't get so stuck in your plan that when you worship and fast and hear from the Holy Spirit and He calls you and wants to send you out, don't get so stuck in your plan that you shut His voice down before He even gets through. But be open and say yes. Amen? Amen. You guys, today in this, this simple, I think low-key message, my challenge is this. If you've got something big going on in life, don't just pray about it, but can I encourage you to pray and fast about it? If worship, if, that, if this is all new to you because you're still growing in it, can I encourage you with this? Engage with it. Speak your praise to God. You don't have to scream it like I do. You don't have to jump up and down, dance around like Pam does. That's the part, and I'm not mocking or making fun. I'm saying... There's no right or wrong way. My encouragement is this. What you do, engage from your heart and do something. Listen for the Holy Spirit 
because I believe he's sending out and I believe people's lives are going to be changed. Amen.